Audio recording for this meeting has begun. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the AgriLinks webinar series. Um, I am Adam Ahmed with AgriLinks, and today I welcome you to a webinar that we are having on what's lurking in your value chain, uncovering the hidden costs of gender-based violence in agriculture. So if you see the chat pod uh, on your screen, you can engage with, with us through there. Type in any questions that you may have, and we'll try to answer them in the chat pod. And we will be saving the longer questions for the Q&A portion of this webinar at the end. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our first presenter, who will be framing today's topic. Her name is Krista Jacobs and she is the Senior Gender Advisor at the Bureau for Food Security. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I hope you all can hear me. Thank you for the introduction, Adam. I'm going to introduce our presenters today and then move into a bit of framing, and then we will hear our two great examples. Our first presenter joining us from Tanzania is Rodrigo Abbas from ACDI VOCA. Rodrigo is a technical research specialist with the Tanzania Nafaka 2 project, where he leads the development and implementation of the project's learning agenda. Before joining Nafaka, Rodrigo held different appointments in both the public and private sector, as well as an international organization. His work focuses on bridging the gaps between research and implementing evidence-based actions at the field level to achieve sustainable rural development. Rodrigo holds a bachelor's in agriculture from the National University of Asuncion and a master's in agribusiness from Texas A&M through a Fulbright. Welcome, Rodrigo. We also have two colleagues joining us today from Unilever. The first is Deline Fisher, who is the vice president of supply chain for East Africa and Unilever tea plantations based in Nairobi. She manages the fast-moving consumer goods supply chain in high-growth emerging markets across Kenya, Ethiopia, Uganda, Rwanda, and Tanzania, as well as the tea plantations in Kenya and Tanzania with approximately 15,000 employees. Deline has over 25 years of supply chain experience and has worked with various and a administration from the University of Stellenbosch. We also have with us today Winfrieda Niaquara from Unilever. She is an experienced human rights lawyer, gender specialist, and social sustainability professional from Kenya. She has over 12 years of experience in human rights, gender, and sustainability work. Winfrieda has a law degree from Moy University in Kenya and a master's in international development from the University of Edinburgh. Winfrieda is the Integrated Social Sustainability Manager in, for Africa at Unilever, where she provides leadership at a local level to embed human rights in the tea operations in Kenya, and she was also part of the team that launched the Safety for Women, Boys, and Girls program in tea operations in East Africa. Welcome, Winfrieda. We also have with us this morning Jennifer Williamson from ACDI VOCA, is our Senior Director for Gender and Social Inclusion. So I'm very excited about this webinar today because talking about gender-based violence in our agricultural programs and in our the communities where we work is not a conversation we've been having as openly as we could. Gender-based violence is an inherently sensitive and complex topic. It's also not something that many agriculture experts are familiar with or comfortable addressing, even though they may be aware of gender-based violence happening associated in their communities and in their work, and often don't want to address it for fear of making it worse. Also, we recognize that gender-based violence happening in the communities where we work and associated with their programs may not be something that you want to bring up to your donor. So with this webinar, we're really hoping to start a conversation where we in the agriculture sector can begin to face some of these fears about preventing and responding to gender-based violence and talking about gender-based violence in the sector and in our programming. But to get us on the same page, I wanted to give one definition of gender-based violence, and this is from the U.S. government's strategy to prevent and respond to GBV globally, which defines gender-based violence 
is violence directed at an individual based on his or her biological sex, gender identity, or perceived adherence to socially defined norms of masculinity and femininity. It includes physical, sexual, and psychological abuse, threats, coercion, arbitrary deprivation of liberty, and economic deprivation, whether occurring in public or private life. And so we need to acknowledge that gender-based violence is happening in the communities we work in. The WHO estimates that 35% of women have experienced either physical or sexual violence. And those are just two aspects of the definition of, of violence that we just covered. We also need to be always mindful that gender-based violence has profound impacts on survivors. For example, women who've experienced physical or sexual intimate partner violence report higher rates of depression, sexually transmitted infections, including HIV, injuries, anxiety disorders, suicide or self-harm, unwanted pregnancy, and babies with low birth weight. Survivors may also suffer isolation, inability to work, loss of wages, lower participation in regular activities, and a more limited ability to care for themselves or their children. The survivors are facing loss of income and productivity, not participating fully in economic life, which may include some of the programs that we are working and hoping to engage people in, and also not fully participating in social life. And we know that those connections, that social life in addition um, to support also fosters social connections and connections with information and services, which are often vital to the work that we're trying to do. You'll see this picture, which I've excerpted from CARES publication, Counting the Cost of Violence. And I wanted to highlight it here because I think it does a good job of articulating the costs of gender-based violence for survivors, families, perpetrators, businesses, and communities. And I raised this not to bring GBV down to a monetary calculation, but to show that while gender-based violence is intensely personal, its effects are far-reaching and costly to society as a whole. So I'm sorry that the graphic is a little bit blurry, um, but in addition to the consequences that, that we just talked about, there are also costs when survivors are accessing health services, legal services. Um, when they are relocating or seeking a safe space to be, as well as the loss of income. Businesses face absenteeism, high turnover, and lost productivity. And there are also social costs that everyone bears um, through the cost that the government is paying. For example, in Peru, um, speaking of businesses, countries, companies lose more than $6.7 billion per year as a result of absenteeism, staff turnover, and lost productivity resulting from domestic violence. The World Bank has estimated in some countries that gender-based violence can cost up to 3.7% of GDP. And in some of the countries where we work, agriculture is responsible for 40% of GDP. So just doing a very quick and dirty back of the envelope application of those two percentages, in some of the places where we work, gender-based violence in the agriculture sector and in rural communities may be costing up to 1% to 2% of GDP. Gender-based violence, or the fear or the expectation of violence, can lower women's participation in our program, which is a reality that I think a lot of us face and think about. It can decide, it can affect how women do or don't decide to participate. But it can also affect programs' effectiveness and their choices. I've been in conversations everywhere from homes and villages to boardrooms around which crops, livestock, or activities projects can work in and choose so that women will be able to participate, earn money, and have leadership, but not so much earning or so much visibility that it would attract attention and lead some people to decide to perpetrate violence against the women or to appropriate their resources and earnings. So much of the work that we do, because it changes resources and their allocation, incomes, decision-making, who has access to information and services, 
and visibility is going to change power dynamics. And I don't think that we can get around that, nor should we pretend that that doesn't happen. Those shifting dynamics or the anticipation of them can increase the risk of violence, and we should be anticipating and watching for that risk. But those same shifts can also be opportunities to create space for people to reflect on the norms and behaviors and make choices away from violence. So today, we'll see examples from an agriculture project and an agribusiness about how each of them chose to engage and grapple with gender-based violence. And with that, I will turn it over to Rodriguez. Thanks, Krista. And it's a pleasure to be here today representing HDA VOCA and the NAFACA project to share with everyone on the other side um, the project's journey to empower a community in, in the fight against GBV. Um, so let's get started. You will hear the word NAFACA a lot today. Um, so let me start by explaining the meaning. Uh, in Swahili, the local language here in Tanzania, it means cereal. And as our name says, we are a market system project um, and our work is to strengthen both the rice and the maize value chain, focusing on increasing access to credit and agricultural inputs, as well as to improve our farmers' abilities to aggregate commodities that will later be sold to either millers, produce processors, and, and other end market buyers. So to accomplish this goal, we conduct a set of activities that are grouped in, uh, under three components. Uh, the first one is strengthening the input supply value chain. And to do so, we support demonstration sites for improved inputs and good agricultural practices. As a part of the activities under this component, we have also developed um, a system of last mile retailers to make sure that farmers at the village level can have timely access to improved agricultural inputs. Um, in our second component, so we work with 300 or about 345 producer organizations to increase their ability to market the members' commodities. Um, and we also provide trainings that will lead to an increased institutional and human capacity. And under our component three activities, we connect millers and processors with farmers and producer organizations to purchase commodities. Uh, we also have a very strong focus on, on food fortification, especially with maize flour, to reduce malnutrition rates in the zones of influence. So as a value chain project, all of these components are interconnected, and the success of one of them is reliant upon the success of the other component. As you can see, uh, we have a very broad scope of work with a very diverse set of activities, but also complementary. Um, so in order to track our progress, we have historically monitored our performance by using indicators like PNTs. Um, we then validate these indicators with experiences from the field through interactions with several market actors and, of course, our beneficiaries. Um, we, I mean, however, we, we acknowledge that uh, even impactful interventions can be unsustainable due to the lack of studies on the reasons behind the effectiveness of certain interventions. So in year two, or out of a four-year program, um, we began the transition towards an evidence-based project with the specific goal of testing the causal relationship between some of our key interventions and their impact. We needed to bring clarity to the path that we were walking on, and, and to do so, we adopted USA's CLA, CLA approach, so collaborating, learning, and adapting, as a tool to assist us in the process of generating sustainable impact. And this transition wasn't always easy. Um, in, in, in this path, we encountered many, many organizational challenges. Um, for those who want to read more about it, I'm not going to go in depth, but um, I've shared a case study where we explain this transition. You'll see it on the left of your, of your screen under File Downloads. So I think senior staff did a really good job in, in not imposing the creation of this culture. Instead, it was slowly developed or nurtured by, incle by, by including activities like pause and reflect sessions in our regional meetings and also monthly meetings where we encourage a safe space atmosphere um, where all questions were good questions and, and each of the staff that participated were encouraged to share both failures and successes. And after some time, we started to reap the benefits of this new learning culture. Uh, we, saw, um, we saw an increase in, in awareness of what can be achieved through research and a lot of the learning questions nowadays are coming from our junior staff. So there's also a higher level of engagement with the project, and I personally believe this is a consequence of a deeper comprehension 
of the of the why behind the impact. Um, we've also seen an increased uh, ability on the side of our staff to do more external collaborations. And in fact, NAFACA is receiving um, a lot of requests for the staff to participate in conferences, uh, implementer collaboration activities, and even government councils. So as a part of this transition towards a project that generate evidence to take action, we set out to measure one of the most emblematic uh, interventions of the project, which is the provision of mechanization grants. For the past two years, NAFACA has worked to deliver technology to several selected producer organizations. And by technology, I mean equipment for land preparation, for example, power tillers, and also equipment for harvest and, and post-harvest activities that can be uh, maize shellers, rice threshers, or, or rice cutters. So the project effort uh, aligned also with the plans of the government of Tanzania to address the low levels of mechanization in the country. And this is a, um, a big problem uh, among rural women who constitute the largest uh, labor force in the agricultural sector of the country with a rate of about 52%, which I think is one of the highest in, in Africa. So our initial plan was to cover all the producers organizations that receive uh, this mechanization grant, so about 40 producer organizations uh, that and, and our POs have uh, an average size of 150 members. So as you can see, this was intended to be um, a large-scale survey that was going to require the use of enumerators to, to collect data. And our initial interest was to measure the effect of these grants on two specific variables. The first one was the amount of time saved by using the machine versus, versus performing this task manually, and also the income generated um, at the PO level as a result of providing these services in the village. So um, where I come from, we have um, a phrase that um, doesn't have a direct translation in English, but it would be something like, the paper can withstand every idea, uh, but implementing those ideas is, is a different thing. And this was around my first month in the project. And after defining the methodology, I, I realized that in, in that year, 2018, the program had conducted two or three large studies. Um, so the reality was that we didn't have enough resources to use enumerators in this process. And we said to ourselves, OK, we're, we're going to scale down the intervention and adapt the methodology to the available resources. So we agreed to focus on, instead of 40, just one producer organization. Uh, we were also going to involve the project staff to assist in the data collection. Um, and we were going to use um, diaries, time diaries, instead of digital collection tools. Uh, and we're going to provide this, these diaries to farmers, which are going to input data. So the new research design resulted in a higher burden of work for, for the team. But it also allowed uh, for more flexibility and the opportunity to expand our objectives. So from our initial objective, which was to measure the grant effect on as a time-saving technology and also as a, as a means to generate income, we included two additional objectives. The second one was to determine the gender gap in time allocation. Uh, we were interested in finding out the intra-household dynamics. How are men and women using their time uh, at the village level or in the house? And a third objective was to understand time use patterns throughout an agricultural season. So we started uh, this activity in December of 2018, and we said to ourselves, why don't we collect data on key moments of the season to better understand uh, how farmers are investing their time through the agricultural season, so that will provide information to us that will enable us to later on take actions on, on how to um, help them to save, to save time. And, and today's, present, today's presentation will focus uh, a lot on, on this second component, the intra-household dynamics. So since we plan to understand the, the intra-household dynamics, we decided to work with couples from the producer organization. And as the title says, we, we turned them into enumerators. They were full-time farmers, and for the week that we worked with them, um, they became part-time enumerators. Farmers were collecting their own data. Since they were uh, collecting data, then we needed to train them on how to do this, uh, how they were going to categorize their daily activities and to group it in, into the diary. For instance, there was a category in the diary um, that was named household chores. So we, we taught farmers that activities like uh, sweeping the floor, cooking, fetching water um, were categorized as household chores. Um, going out with friends uh, or watching a football match uh, belonged to social activities. 
And this process wasn't easy. Uh, for a lot of women, for instance, child care was not seen as work. Uh, or we had cases where a lot of our female farmers thought that uh, fetching water was leisure. Uh, they didn't perceive it as, as work uh, before. So it, it took some time for, for farmers to, to grasp this concept. Um, we also worked with separate groups. So we had female staff working with female farmers and male staff working with male farmers. And we thought that they would increase the confidence in, in case there were sensitive topics uh, that came up in the discussions. Uh, and that way we would also avoid um, any influence from men over women or, or perhaps not wanting to share something that you don't want your couple to know. Um, so farmers would record the, their time use data for a seven day period. And, and during that week, uh, we went back to the village several times to do data quality assessments to all the households that were participating in the activity. Uh, we needed to make sure that they were properly categorizing the activities, that they were not forgetting about any activities, that they were also uh, including all the hours that they worked throughout the day. Um, in a week after we delivered the journals, we went back and collected the, the diaries and, and we engaged in discussions with farmers about the, their experiences, uh, the challenges, and also, of course, the learnings in this process. So as you can see from these pictures, uh, this was um, a very participative process. Uh, uh, there was a very close relationship between a teacher and students, let's say, in this case, with an APACA figure being the, the teacher, and also uh, among students. So a month after collecting the data, um, we went back to the village for two reasons. This picture is from a debriefing session in, in, in January of, of 2019. Um, and as I said, we went back to the village for two reasons. First, for accountability purposes. Uh, this activity created a lot of expectations on the side of farmers uh, who wanted to see the results of their work. They were very curious about how they were using their time. And the second reason was to validate the results. Um, we needed to see if the information that we got from the journals really reflected the reality at the field level. And during these conversations, we realized that the diaries, coupled with an increased trust from working in groups, had a consequence that we did not initially foresee. Um, they, they were disclosing a lot of information, especially women, um, that they couldn't share in their communities. Uh, about inequalities, about the inequalities that they were subject to at the household level. And, and here is where we started hearing stories about intimate partner violence. So some of the women told us their husbands came drunk at night and beat them for no apparent reason. Others said that uh, they would be open about the income earned with their couples, uh, but when they asked their husbands the same question, they would be beaten or cursed. And violence was not only physical. Uh, we had examples of women who would work for a whole agricultural season in their plots. They would harvest the rice, uh, and at some point before they sold it, the husband came to the plot and already finished the transaction with an intermediary. Um, and they would have no idea, uh, the women that own those plots would have no idea about the income generated or the amount of, of um, cereals that were, were sold. In this case, we were working with rice farmers. Um, so these women seem to be trapped in this circle of violence and what is worse, uh, they felt powerless because they did not see a way out of it. And I would lie if I said we were not uncomfortable with this situation and that we immediately knew what to do. Um, I remember being in the car on, on our way back after that discussion um, and the whole team was somehow in a state of shock. Uh, confronting these issues can be paralyzing, especially because our expertise is deeply rooted in agriculture and not in, in gender-related issues. So our first reaction was to seek help externally. We said that um, there were certainly people out there that had the proper training to address GDV directly. So we contacted several projects here in the country that were working with uh, gender-based violence and we shared the contact information with the farmers that were subject to this situation, to this problem. Um, we took another step and we say, okay, um, we reach out to the local government authorities to push for the creation of a gender desk at the local police station. So this would be a specific room that has um, the proper infrastructure to provide privacy when a woman is um, going to the police station to report um, a GBV case. Uh, and it also, of course, has to have the, a, a trained personnel to address these issues. 
But we felt a sense of dissatisfaction, to be honest. Um, this was not enough. The impact of these actions, the, the, the external collaboration actions, uh, were somehow out of the project's control. Um, and, and women in that community trusted us with the information because they believed we could help them. So they did not discuss these issues in their villages because sharing these concerns were embarrassing and frowned upon. And more importantly, because women were not believed over men. So this is where we started reflecting about what we could do as a project. And I think that the, that the learning culture that I described before was fundamental in this process. Um, we went back, so we started this process in which we went back to reflect on the evidence that we collected. And here we discover a few things. So we did um, a survey of our 345 producer organizations and we were trying to understand the leadership structure. So we realized that leadership positions are dominated by men. Between 70 to 75 percent of men occupy key positions like chairperson, secretary and coordinator. The only position where the balance tilts, the balance tilts towards women uh, is treasurer. And this is not because men trust women uh, on how to allocate the money, but they do trust them on, how, on, on keeping their money. So um, something that I, I should mention is that because of logistical reasons, when we provide trainings to producer organizations, uh, we conduct them with the leaders. And after this, they are the ones that should cascade this knowledge with their members. But we started digging deeper and we realized that the communication flow was inadequate and that these trainings were not always shared or the knowledge of these trainings was not always shared with members. So um, we had to be very careful because indirectly we could have been concentrating opportunities on, on leaders and in this case they were men, um, which, which could have exacerbated the differences and, and the knowledge gap uh, between men and women. Uh, so the second, the second uh, piece of evidence was uh, to analyze the effectiveness of our trainings. We said, we sit down with uh, the, woman, uh, the women at the village uh, that participated in the um, Time Diaries activity, and we realized that those who participated in the FACA trainings inside their POs had more decision power in their households. And they did have an influence over how money was allocated. Um, and Coincidentally, 75% of the women uh, that had access to these trainings were, were leaders. So we realized that trainings and access to leadership can empower women by giving them more confidence and skill to actively participate in the household decisions. And the last piece of the puzzle, and the one that allowed us to see the whole picture, were the diaries, the information that the diaries provided. We realized that there was an uneven distribution of time. Uh, women worked for about two or three additional hours per day compared to their male counterparts. And the largest portion of this working time was dedicated to domestic and care work. So about 60% of women's working time was dedicated to more reproductive activities, while uh, men only spent 23% of their time on the same task. On the same task. So these three pieces of information uh, came as a revelation to us. Um, they made us realize that GBV was the consequence of a much bigger problem, uh, which is the social and cultural perception of women in, in rural societies. Women are perceived as less capable of doing certain activities and, and they are confined to reproductive and non-remunerated work. So um, the decision of making ability is also restricted, especially when we talked about income. And, and these perceptions are the ones that affect their participation in capacity building opportunities and in taking more leadership positions. So once we embrace this reality, we were compelled to act to eliminate GBV by attacking the roots of the problem. Uh, we realized uh, that we could do so through what we did best, which is agricultural interventions. Um, and so NAFACA implemented a three-stage approach. Um, the first thing that we did was to say we, we acknowledge that our trainings do have an effect on, on a women's capacity and, and the image in, in gaining confidence to be active uh, members in their community. So we said we need to increase the number of women who participate in our trainings. Uh, and we did this by enforcing an effective cascading system. So after we conducted every uh, training with the leadership, what we did was to schedule in the next week, in the next two weeks, 
um, a session in which the leadership would cascade this training to the rest of their members. So we agreed on a date and then Afaka staff went back to the village uh, during that date to check that the training was really taking place um, and also to register the amount of people that were participating. We took a step further and we also talked to the leadership of APO to ask them a, a database of their members and, and their phone numbers. And we have an SMS platform by which we can send messages to different people, uh, and in this case the members of the community, at a very low cost. So what we did was to, um, before the training, we sent uh, a message to, the, um, to all the members, uh, letting them know that there was a training happening on a specific topic, on a specific date, and the location where it was going to take place. The second step was to attempt to change the leadership structure of, of these producer organizations. So for this, we identified all the POs that were conducting election before the end of, of this year uh, and also throughout 2020. Two or three weeks before uh, members present the formal uh, application to become candidates, uh, we conduct trainings uh, with the community and, and with the producer organization uh, in which we highlight the importance of including women and youth in, in the leadership structure. We have also uh, continued with our women's empowerment training, but we do them a bit differently. We have seen that this um, approach where we invite the couple to participate work certainly more effective. Uh, it's certainly more effective than individual trainings. And this is because it increases the accountability at the household level. Um, so both members of the couples have been exposed to the training. Uh, they know that there are certain things that must be changed. And, and this encourages discussions at the household level. Um, during the, the following rounds of data collection, we also brought in our regional gender specialists um, to listen to women and, and to work with them with a more gender-specific approach. I would also like to, to highlight in, in this process the, the role of, of USA, which I think its support has been instrumental in, in, in this process to address DVD. Uh, when we approach them with the findings in, in January, we acknowledge the limitations in uh, that we were not um, a gender project and, and that we didn't have a lot of experiences in terms of gender intervention. So they immediately linked us to a GBV project that conducted a training in our annual meeting to all the staff on the We are about 72 people working in the project. So we were trained on what is GBV. Um, what are the causes, the consequences, and more importantly, how to address it at the village level when we uh, conduct our, our different activities. Um, they've been also very supportive on continuing with, with the work to understand the impact of, of what we can do better, but they're also interesting, uh, interested in, to see the results in, since they will use them to further inform other program interventions that use similar activities to the ones we do. So as you can see, we have used quite a, a holistic approach, and I believe that the interaction with, with other stakeholders, coupled with the project actions, are putting us a, a step closer to change these cultural perceptions. And in doing so, uh, we've started tackling GBV. And, and just to wrap up, um, I, I want to leave you with a couple of reflections. I think uh, the, the, this research did not start out looking for, for gender-based violence, but in the process of measuring the effects, of an agricultural intervention, we discovered a hidden problem, uh, one that was harming women and that the project was unaware of. Addressing this was, for us, not only a matter of, of doing the right thing, but ensuring that as an inclusive market system project, we were not leaving anyone behind. Um, Krista mentioned at the beginning of her presentation that the cost um, of, of GBV, and indirectly we could have been exacerbating this, this difference and, and leaving the community worse off. Um, so here's what I want to highlight, the, the power of evidence. Uh, NAFACA embraced a, a research approach, um, and, and we have started to take evidence-based actions that will yield sustainable impact on, on the community. And in, in the meantime, the, the, the Time Diaries had an unintended consequence that is leading the way to a paradigm shift. Uh, farmers are, not, are now aware of how they use their time, and this in itself has empowered them. Knowing how they use their time is the first step to making changes on, on, on that time distribution. So uh, with, in working with farmers, um, we realized that male household heads are recognizing the amount of activity women do, and, we have begun to, uh, and they have begun to assist in, in sharing responsibilities. 
couples are also discussing about time management and that has uh, brought families closer, uh, increased joint making decision and there's also a higher collaboration at the household level. So NAFACA turned a resource limitation into an opportunity to expose a reality that even though existed, it was somehow invisible because of the lack of data. And we have started to address the roots of a problem that marginalizes women in, in rural areas. We are confident that, that the work that we're doing is, is going to change the lives of women, of the women and men that we work with. And we believe that this could have a ripple effect in, in their communities. Thanks, and um, I'll be glad to answer any questions uh, during the Q&A time. Thank you, Rodrigo. And with that, we will be moving over to our presenters from Unilever. Hi, everybody. It's uh, Deline here, and I'm with uh, Winfrieda. Uh, we're together in the in the same room, so we'll be jointly presenting and sharing. And uh, just to give some context, I guess uh, we were uh, asked if we could share some of our. Uh, uh, learnings and also programs with yourself and also a little bit uh, of why Unilever is actually um, putting in an extensive effort to focus on various things but G GBV is one of the areas of a very important uh, focus for Unilever. So give, to give a little bit of context, um, I thought I'd start off with Unilever's vision and that is um, to make uh, uh, sustainable living commonplace and uh, Unilever believes that it's uh, the best way to ensure long-term business growth um, and that, that basically led to a, a big sustainability program that they've launched and um, the clear vision of this program is to find a new way of working um, as an FMCG, uh, one that delivers growth by serving society and the planet uh, and so the concerted effort started from there. So the aim is uh, to decouple growth as an FMCG from the environmental footprint while also at the same time increasing uh, positive social impact. So to do this, they have uh, Unilever has three very uh, big goals that they want to achieve. And the first one is to improve the health and well-being for more than one billion people. Um, the second one is to reduce the environmental impact by half, and I think it's a greater uh, uh, a target by now, uh, looking at the plastic agenda. And then also the third one is to enhance the livelihoods of millions of people. So around that third objective or goal, um, it is where they've got uh, uh, one of the sub-objectives is to opportunity to develop opportunities for women and as an area of focus. And um, to focus on opportunities for women, there's uh, four key areas. Uh, the one is to build a gender balanced organization with focus on management. So we all have targets and it's glo a global agenda to ensure that um, our management on, uh, on all levels are balanced from a gender perspective. Yeah. They also promote safety for women in communities we operate in. So a lot of our discussion today is really on that part um, of the Unilever program. Um, enhancing, of course, uh, access to training and skills, which we also do in our plantations, uh, which is mostly we will touch on today, and then um, expand opportunities in our value chain. So really it's focused on, on safety for women in communities, enhancing access to training, development, and, 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 and supporting uh, gender equality. Um, so a little bit to get, just give context on, on GBV and Unilever. Um, Unilever has a very strong uh, core value system which is focused on purpose because they, um, we believe as Unilever a company with purpose will thrive and people with purpose will grow and thrive as well. And really with regards to uh, the, the agenda for gender-based violence, um, in terms of a company um, you know, applying resources and focus on it, it's just the right thing to do. We operate in the plantations. Um, Part of why I'm here is I head up the plantations in East Africa where we have um, up to 15,000 um, people who work for us, but if you add their families, uh, their children, because they live on our plantations, it can be up to 50,000 people we actually have uh, you know, on our plantation. So 
it is the right thing to do. It's aligned with the company's purpose to focus on the health and well-being of, of everybody, and in this case specifically uh, relating to women in agriculture. As Rodrigo also mentioned earlier, and, and, and Krista, that a lot of the, the, uh, the of our work is in agriculture, a big part of them are women, and hence the focus. And the benefits, uh, there's no real financial, we didn't calculate um, a financial benefit. That is why it's more aligned with the company's purpose. It's the right thing to do, but of course we want our women to thrive. It does help to improve productivity and, and in essence, indirectly also business growth, but it's not the primary uh, reason why Unilever has uh, started off many programs which Winfrieda will share with you. It's really aligned with if we're going to operate where we have large communities uh, and uh, in agriculture, for example, in East Africa, where we're responsible for 15,000 directly and indirectly up to 50,000 people, is make sure that, that we do the right thing with the community, with our, our employees. So I'll hand over to Winfrieda that will share a bit more because she drives our program directly and responsible for developing it. Hi everyone, um, Winfrieda here for Un from Unilever. Um, just a bit of context setting. Um, uh, Deline has, has, has just uh, given us a brief in terms of this being the right thing to do. Um, for us as Unilever, I think what we are saying is um, GBV is an endemic issue. It's not only just an agriculture issue. It's beyond agriculture. It's beyond Unilever. So essentially what we are saying is it cuts across different levels of relationship, community, individual. And I think what's important for us as a business is to really look at how this impacts us as a business, how that impacts our people. And as we have, um, as our purpose really um, uh, affirms is that people with purpose thrive. And we want people to thrive and we want the company also to thrive. So essentially for us, that is one of the main reasons why we really um, look to address this. And uh, um, our commitment is actually um, working closely with different partners to address this issue. If you look at um, the different countries we're in, we're also very keen to understand what are the prevalence levels, why, um, what can we do about it, who can we partner with, and I'll be speaking to that in the next as we move on. Um, so I just want to speak into um, the what we say what, what we believe are the seven practical steps to address um, GBV. And for us, this is a practical. This is actually um, from our own experience as Unilever and how we have gone about addressing GBV within our own business, uh, particularly our plantations um, in the tea sector. Um, one and very core is actually leadership commitment. And without leadership commitment, and first, leadership recognition of the issue, yeah, understanding mm -hmm. the issue, understanding what impact it has on the community, what impact it has on the business and your people, and committing to make a difference. And this, of course, will translate into policy, will translate into your goodwill, your engagement, and what you're doing as a leader to make a difference. Your strategy, is it part of your strategy? Is it core? Is it... Is it, is, it, is, it, is, it, is it parallel? Is it, is it important? Is that the message that you are sending down? So for us, leadership commitment comes out very strongly. Um, and definitely having an unbiased view of the situation is also important to understand um, what baseline um, are you having, what, what is really the issue on the ground, um, and, and what, what, what would we be addressing. So having that informed view of the situation and having it unbiased and being very clear on what that will help you to determine your intervention, your programs, and how to move forward, even in terms of who do you need in terms of resourcing. And from there, you move. Uh, uh, we move to resourcing, building expertise, and having that management buy-in. Remember, this is not a very traditional area for most of our management, because um, if you look at if you look at most businesses, um, there's that view that uh, profit is actually what drives the business. But um, slowly does that change and businesses are starting to recognize that people and profit are pretty much very important um, and there's really no uh, hierarchy in, in, in that regard. So resourcing um, for Unilever for us is about bringing in the right people and uh, to be honest that's how I joined Unilever six years ago. So um, <clears throat> it's bringing the right people with the right knowledge, the right expertise and even the commitment to make a difference. 
And um, the discussion around gender balance organization is also to just make sure that we have women who also are leaders and can also be able to support other leaders. So women leadership and empowerment programs to help women also grow and women also access the different opportunities and have the right skills and the right um, uh, leadership uh, skills to do that. And maybe Dilin can speak on the management yes. buying. Yeah, so I think what's important to note from a, this is more from an, uh, obviously a global organizational perspective is um, we started this program and uh, people like Winnie has been really great in helping us develop a framework uh, in terms of from, uh, to start to work with gender-based violence and these kind of issues. I think the leadership commitment is key. It's important that it's not seen as, so we have a lot of people in uh, from social welfare working on it, working for Unilever, working on this issue and especially with me here in East Africa. Um, but it's not, it should not be seen as a social welfare issue. It's, it's from top down a leadership recognition, admitting there's an issue, and then working with uh, HR, even security and welfare, and then make it a cross-functional drive, supported by the business. Um, even our managers who manage their uh, parts of their plantations need to own that this is an important agenda and support our welfare, HR and security teams that are working on the safety and the health and security of people. Yeah. So it's really pretty much the message that it's a joint effort and, it, and it, it's supported across. So even the commitment that we can't just uh, talk the talk in saying that we recognize the issue, it, it, it's also it's actually funding it, funding yeah. the programs, actually putting money behind it. So Unilever does put a lot of money behind this issue, for example. We do a lot of work with the UN Women as an example, and, and but also resources, headcount, so actually, um, hence, you know, recognizing that part of doing business, you need that as part of your investment. Yeah. Um, uh, investing uh, in people. Investing <laughs> in people, in the communities, and for the health and well-being uh, of those communities. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I think I've spoken briefly in terms of integration, and by integration, I mean, um, this, this um, addressing GBV, uh, whether it's sexual harassment in the workplace, whether it's intimate partner violence, any form of GBV is actually uh, not a by the way. It's actually supposed to be our core responsibility. So people are our core responsibility. And that's why every manager, every leader is actually involved and responsible for the well-being of their people, the health and well-being of their people. And uh, maybe just to speak briefly um, on... Um, and one of the things that we did uh, when we started is we actually had to revamp our own strategy, our own business strategy, and ensure that we had what we call social good as one of the pillars of ensuring that, um, that our business thrives. So just making sure that there's that call out on this is important and this is, 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 is part of our DNA as a business. Um, the other thing which is important and also um, really helps close that, that, that loop in terms of addressing these issues is having an effective grievance mechanism. A lot has been spoken about effective grievance mechanism and what makes it effective, but I would speak to um, it has to be trusted. You have to trust the grievance mechanism. People have to know that you're not only accessible, but that you will do something about the reports that they give you and that they can always get remedy or they can always get feedback and they can always be satisfied with the, 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 the remedy that they get. And ensuring that um, um, you get learnings from those um, um, grievance mechanisms. One of the things that we actually did was to have a toll-free hotline um, to just make sure that people are able to report without the barriers of finances or, you know, costs, and, and, and also make sure that the confidentiality is also very key for us here. So uh, grievance mechanisms comes in for us very important. Um, uh, but like I said, we are more proactive in terms of focusing mainly on prevention and ensuring that response is actually a small bit of what we do. Then recognizing that as a business, this might not be our core expertise, um, so we also bring in other, other, other actors, um, the nonprofit, other organizations. We've worked with quite a number of organizations, um, uh, both locally and globally, to um, deliver uh, our agenda of um, zero GBV or reducing GBV within our, our, our business and collaborating with UN Women and I'll be speaking to the work we've done with UN Women briefly as we move on and, and that for us uh, presents really, uh, it helps us to strengthen the model that we have uh, currently 
and continuing to improve and address our issues um, both within our plantation but also without um, looking at the communities that we work with, the smallholder farmers and supporting the community as a whole. Then finally in this process and just to just wrap it up in terms of the, the, the steps is monitoring progress and reporting and always looking to learn and continuously improve uh, what uh, you know improve 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 um, your mod our model uh, in this in this uh, space yeah so um yeah so maybe just to speak on um, uh, the UN women program uh, we we, we, we had we initiated a partnership in um, in 2016 with UN Women, and this partnership was um, predominantly to strengthen. At that time, we had uh, a safety for women, girls, and boys model in in Kericho, and uh, so the partnership was um, initially to strengthen this model and help us develop an evidence-based approach or model that would work. Um, for us, and something that we can replicate um, beyond uh, beyond the retail, beyond the tea sector, and uh, develop a framework, and and that's what we have on your right hand side, uh, the global women's safety framework that can be used with our suppliers, can be used in the agricultural sector to be able um, to help them to implement um, to 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 promote safety within their workspaces. So. Um, this has been a journey. This has been a journey, and um, just to briefly speak on 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 how that looked like. Um, I was speaking to prevention as the one of the strongest pillars that really takes predominantly like eighty percent of our time. Uh, we focus mostly on prevention and ensuring that we are very, um, you know, we are proactive in terms of how we 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 we, we, we protect our people. And our detection mechanism, working with our security team, both um, internally and externally, to make sure that we are very clear, that we understand the signs, and we have the early warning signs of what could be, um, what what could go wrong, and mapping different hotspots, understanding the trends. Um, for example, when you have uh, bonuses being paid out, what are the risks? Or what could be the issues that could emerge from there? And being proactive about it, by having um, the detection mechanisms in place. Um, I've spoken to response, which for us, um, one of the things that I'd like to really emphasize here is one of the things, um, psychosocial support really plays a very big role when it comes to response, and that is the area where most of us uh, normally miss it. We, we, we don't really look to address the trauma that um, our survivors and their families face, and for us this is a very big part of our response in addition to ensuring that the cases are being reported, um, both internally and externally, and the redress mechanisms, uh, the the remedies have been have been have been issued, but also to ensure that um, the trauma is also our, our survivors and their families are also um, um, are counselled and 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 supported um, beyond um, beyond the issues that they are facing. Then I've spoken to external engagement. This really is part of our strengthening our programs and ensuring that we have a holistic intervention. Yeah. Um, so just to wrap it up, maybe just to speak to the Global Women's Safety Framework. This is um, a framework that is available to all of us, and it's available um, beyond the um, beyond uh, any 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 sector in agriculture could actually use this framework. And we are also very open to share any learning um, on this framework and to also share it across um, if if that would be of interest. Thank you. Thank you so much, Celine and Winfrieda. Um, we will open up to Q&A in a few minutes. Um, but I first want, want to thank you for your, your presentations, um, all three of you. And also note your, your point um, that you made, Winfrieda and Deline, about being proactive, about watching and being aware, having those processes, whether they be grievance mechanisms or others in place. But also your point about kind of what can we do more um, to really acknowledge and help people work through the trauma, and is that our role? Um, I think is an open question as agricultural programs. 
Um, but I appreciate that both both of our examples, you know, really did reach out to others in their area with expertise. So before we go into the Q and A, I wanted to highlight three selected tools for preventing and responding to gender-based violence in the agriculture sector. These are not all of the tools, and hopefully soon there, there will be more. The first is USAID's toolkit for integrating GBV prevention and response into economic growth projects. It has sections specifically for agriculture and food security, as well as value chain development, enterprise development, access to finance, trade policy, and cross-border trade, all of which are relevant to agriculture. And it has steps for activity design and implementation, as well as illustrative indicators. It has several kind of guides and recommendations. I won't go through all of them, um, but some of them do speak to mapping stakeholders and institutions around your project that can help with gender-based violence and have those expertise. Working with women leaders and building women's leadership, especially in producer organizations, but also building women farmers' capacity for bargaining and negotiation, as well as identifying coping strategies for lean seasons, um, which can be a time of increased gender-based violence. The second tool is from the Food and Agriculture Organization. How can we protect men, women, and children from gender-based violence? Addressing GBV in the food security and ag sector. This uses the perspective of FAO's program cycle and is more specific to their work, but it does speak to cash and voucher programs, which I know is of interest for a lot of us. Um, it has several case studies and some guidance on how to do needs assessment, referral procedures, setting up feedback mechanisms with your communities, and monitoring, evaluation, and learning. And I've also um, provided the link to the tool that Unilever and UN Women worked on, so I won't go any further into that. But now I'd like to hand it over to Jen Williamson from ACDI Boca to talk about some upcoming work we're doing. Hi, this is Jen Williamson. I am not only the senior gender advisor for, or excuse me, the senior <laughs> advisor for gender and social inclusion at ACDI Boca, but I'm also the gender and agriculture systems advisor for the Advancing Women's Empowerment Project funded by Feed the Futures Bureau for Food Security. I advance the slide. Uh, where's the learning agenda slide? Which one? Learning agenda slide. Uh, I didn't get a learning agenda slide. Okay, that's all right. I'm um, I'm going uh, off off the PowerPoint uh, into into a field unknown at the moment. Um, the reason I'm, I'm speaking to you briefly is because, as you know, um, the, the gender-based violence and agriculture theme uh, is a partnership between the Advancing Women's Empowerment Project and AgriLinks. And our project, Advancing Women's Empowerment, is, is very much focused on uh, learning around what, how we can promote women's empowerment in the agriculture sector. So uh, we also provide a, a lot of opportunities for capacity building and, uh, and, and learning how we can do our jobs better and this work better in this sector. So we have received uh, support to do learning as a learning agenda under this, this project, and we are going to be working on uh, this learning agenda for the next few years. It has three learning streams, which we're launching right now. We're very excited about them. The first learning stream, you will not be surprised to, to hear, is focused on gender-based violence in agriculture. So we're very excited to kick this off. And the first activities we'll actually be doing uh, will, actually, will be focused on identifying tools and resources to better support this work. We are aware after doing an evidence scan and a, and a consultation process that involves speaking to uh, stakeholders and experts in both the you know, US aid sector uh, implementers, a, a variety of people, that there is a lack of resources specifically targeting agriculture and how to address gender-based violence. So we want to help that situation and learn how we can do this better. We know that there are more resources in other sectors. So we're starting off by collecting and learning about those resources, finding out what's out there, what's working, and how we can bring some resources from the existing knowledge into agriculture. So that's our first uh, step in the gender-based violence learning agenda, and we'll be sharing more about that as we, as we go through that process. There will be more activities after that, um, but we'll be sharing that as we go forward. 
we have two other learning streams. Um, the first one we're embarking on as well simultaneously with gender-based violence is about promoting women's empowerment in beyond production. As you know, a lot of the work we do in agriculture is targeted at the production level, but a lot of really important work happens outside of production as we're working in value chains and market systems. So we're also looking to capture learning and best practices and how to promote women's empowerment in these really important areas. So that's also embarking with looking at what's happening, what are best practices, how are we measuring it, how are we promoting it, and, uh, and we're also going to be doing some impact assessments as part of that. So that is also coming. We're hoping to add a third learning stream uh, after that around decision making. I've already seen some questions about this, and as you know, decision making is obviously a very important element. Uh, we've already been looking at decision making in production through the Women's Empowerment and Agriculture Index and coming through the PROWEA in a number of important ways. But we know that decision making is a very complex process and, and connects to many important things like decision making over production, but also income. So this is a learning stream that's in development, and we're hoping to come to you soon sooner rather than later with more information about that. But we're not learning for learning's sake, we're learning for application, so we will be coming to you with more information on that. Great, thank you, Jen, for, for summarizing that so well on the fly. <laughs> I'm sorry we didn't have a slide for you. Um, so with that, I'll open to Q&A, and please type your additional questions in the chat box. We've been collecting the ones that you have been typing so far. And the first that I want to open with is from Abdrahman Diallo, asking, in a nutshell, what are the common types of gender-based violence specific to your agriculture that research has found? I think all of the forms of gender-based violence um, are present in the agriculture sector. We've certainly seen economic violence, um, you know, who physically receives the income, who is even aware um, of what income exists and deciding how that income is spent. We've seen, you know, income taken away. We've seen, you know, there are well-documented gaps in resources, land, inputs. Um, but we also do see physical and sexual violence. We see sexual harassment as well. We also see coercion. Um, so I, I think it's all there, but I want to, to open to, to our presenters to talk about what any specific forms or surprises that they encountered in terms of the gender-based violence that they saw in their own settings. Rodrigo de Lina Winfrieda, did you want to say anything? Do we need to unmute you? Um, uh, Rodrigo, go ahead. Oh, thanks, thanks, Lynn. Um, yeah, I would agree with with Krista. In in our experience, and I was as I was mentioning in my presentation, we did encounter um, physical violence. I think that was happening uh, more often than anything. Um, we've seen sexual harassment, certainly. Uh, we've also encountered several cases of economic violence, and I think um, this is uh, coupled with more of a um, psychological sort of, of violence in terms of uh, diminishing the position of, of um, women in, in society. So I think that if um, we take a look, I mean, we've worked a lot with, with social dynamics and um, we, can, we can discuss about um, social power at the village level and, and, and also personal power, which I think is two very different concepts. Um, so what we have done in order to address the DD is so, so social power is basically a, a result of um, a, a, a group of people or a person controlling, having a, a higher control over his, uh, limited assets uh, or resources comparing to, to other people. So in this case, I think that uh, for the Nafaka example, it, the, the, the resource would be the social perception that there is in, in rural societies of, of women. And, and this always is against women. So men have leverage in terms of uh, activities that women shouldn't do and activities that women 
uh, should be doing. Um, what we have done to tackle these different forms of violence is to work more on the personal power side. Uh, personal power comes from the inner inner resources that a person has, whether these are this can be confidence, it can be a set of skills, and and also uh, training through capacity building opportunities. And I think that um, uh, we we are trying to balance social power by increasing uh, uh, personal power. Yeah, um, great. So for us, if you look around our region, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Please go ahead. So um, top on the list is actually intimate partner violence. Um, that's quite, quite an issue, even in the country as a whole. Then, of course, there is the um, attempted defilement or defilement. And by this, I also mean uh, when you have teenagers who are below the age of 18, some actually having transactional sex rather than just children, um, you know, um, toddlers or children below the age of um, 10 years. So that's also an issue. Um, and just generally physical assault um, uh, for man to woman without necessarily having any gender relations. Um, yeah, so um, the domestic violence and uh, the farmer. Great, thank you for that. We have another um, question from Mariama Ashcroft um, asking about addressing land ownership for women's empowerment um, and integrating GBV prevention approaches. I have a background in gender and land, so I'm always happy when people want to integrate um, gender property rights and gendered land rights into programs. And certainly that is a very, you know, land ownership is a very foundational and potentially very impactful um, prevention strategy for gender-based violence and also good for economic empowerment in general. That doesn't mean it's right for every agriculture program to do, but certainly we've, um, we've worked with a few agriculture programs who have done um, women's and gendered land rights training with women and men and found people to be very, very interested and found that to be transformational. So it's something that we certainly love to see, but again, it's a very, you know, it's an undertaking in itself to do. And then I think Rodrigo, um, there were several questions about illiteracy. Did you want to address any of those and how that affected how you, you did your research and engaged communities? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Krista. It's a question that came up a lot and I think it's something that I did not have time to mention uh, during the presentation. So, that, I mean, we were providing uh, diaries to farmers in which they needed to read the information that was there and also um, input data, so they needed to know how to read and write. Um, in this process, what we did is um, we worked with litter farmers uh, for, the, for the activity, and two weeks before we went to the village and started working with the couples, we conducted literacy trainings at the village level. So we selected, um, we invited everyone in the PO to participate in the activity, and, and we conducted a literacy test in which farmers would a, read a piece of text and then they would respond to, to a set of questions. So this was our, our first filter. Um, we then went to review these documents and, and we realized that there were some farmers that couldn't respond to the questions uh, and the farmers that, let's say, passed um, were the ones who were included, included in the activity. Um, but the journals or, or the diaries in, in itself, they, they perhaps need a higher level of comprehension than just reading and writing. As I was saying, farmers need to know um, how to categorize uh, their activities into different categories. They need to know how to measure uh, time use in, in general. So what we did, we conducted two days trainings. And, and during the first training, we would provide, um, during the morning, we would explain to farmers all the concepts, uh, what are the activities that feed into each of these categories, how should they go about to, to fill the journals. And after lunch, we would do um, a set of exercises. So we would um, use one or two days, uh, and, and they would farmers would have to go through the process of recording their activities, uh, as they would do once we provided the, the diaries. 
So this was also a way of ensuring that, that farmers were understanding the concept. In, in these situations, we had um, farmers that uh, just couldn't make it. There were some other farmers that, uh, in this were discussions with, we had discussions with the team leaders in which um, they would tell us, okay, uh, I can work with this farmer um, it, between this afternoon and, and the whole day tomorrow of training, I'm sure. Uh, this person can can get to the point we we intend them to get. Uh, so that that first day of training was a, somehow a filter to us. And what are the implications of this? Um, as you realize, we we just work with a, with literate farmers, and we did a, a very thorough check to make sure that they had the abilities to complete data because we wanted to we wanted them to meet the the highest standards in terms of uh, data quality. Um, and through this process, then we were not able to cover um, a population of, of people in, in the village, people that are illiterate. Um, I also mentioned that we were working with couples because we wanted to understand the intra-household dynamics. So this means that people that were single or divorced or widowers uh, could not participate in, in this activity. So what we're doing now, uh, building on this um, time diary activities, we concluded the data collection in, in September so uh, we're not gonna. We're now going to roll out uh, for every intervention that NAFACA conducts, no matter if it's uh, training in, in full army worm uh, or if we're in a demo plot uh, showing farmers the um, the yields of a specific a specific variety. Then we were planning to do um, an activity similar to the time diaries, but not with that level of complexity. We're just going to use pictorials. Um, and uh, using, for example, grains of maize or, or rice, um, farmers are going to, based on those pictures, um, say, okay, I spend more or less time in this activity. Um, I do uh, more household chores or I do more social activities. Um, so we have found a way uh, to adapt the methodology in order to include the population that with this pilot uh, we couldn't include because of the requirements that they needed to have. Thank you, Rodrigo, and I think your response also answers, uh, to some degree, Kathy Fury's questions about quantifiable results and that you guys are working on additional research and hopefully in the coming months we'll, we'll have more to share. Um, I want to turn a question over to Jen Williamson. This is from Loretta Byrne. There seems to be an assumption that all agriculture projects have not been aware of gender issues or GBV but very often gender specialists do not understand agriculture production, and this is not new. Jen, do you have a, a response? Yes, I think um, Loretta is raising uh, an important issue that needs further clarification for us. So I think when we're talking about a learning agenda on gender-based violence in agriculture, um, one of the things that's important for recognizing about the drive for this learning agenda is because this is actually coming out of a demand from the agriculture sector. And it's not that agriculture projects have not been aware of GBV, GBV issues. It's precisely because they are aware of GBV issues. So she's raising, Loretta, you're raising a really important point, and you're absolutely right about that. The question is not whether GBV is happening, but how, what do we do about it, and how do we address it? And so the learning agenda is not just about um, identifying what to do, but identifying what some of that great learning is in the field and how we can scale it up. One of the reasons I mentioned reaching out to other sectors is because some other sectors have been acknowledging and addressing this issue for a longer time. So some of them have scalable approaches, resources that we can learn from, but clearly we need to adapt it for the specific needs of the agriculture sector but also combining that with the really important learning that's been happening in the field and on the ground. Um, one of the reasons we titled this session the way we did is not just because of the holiday tomorrow, but also because our conversations with stakeholders and with implementers and donors have been that this is so scary. Um, a lot of times, you're absolutely right, people are aware of this, but they don't know what to do about it. They're scared to talk about it, scared to address it. Um, and so a lot of times, uh, gender advisors know about it, but, but may not actually get the air and space to address it, the resources they need to address it. Or other technical specialists really don't know who to reach out to or how to get the support they need. 
So we're excited that there is so much energy and interest around this topic. And what's new about it is actually the energy and the willingness to address it. So what we want to do as a, as a project and as our learning agenda is to help facilitate conversations, to help surface existing learning and knowledge and help bring this together so that we can identify those scalable approaches, identify those promising practices, and bring those knowledgeable actors together so that they can share it in a space where they feel safe. Uh, so, so you've raised an important and, and correct issue, but also we, we don't want to pe people to make assumptions about who knows what. Because there are many gender specialists that do know agriculture, um, but may not know gender-based violence. And we also want to empower our agriculture and our market systems and our learning specialists to address these issues in, in partnership with other practitioners. So thank you for raising that issue. Thank you both to both of you for raising the issue and for responding so so well. I want to turn now um, to a question from Gina Alvarado for Rodrigo, asking to know more about what elements of the project life cycle and the project management allowed some of the lessons and some of the things you were seeing in the in the research you were doing to be integrated so soon without you know, having to go through project reviews and evaluations, but really to integrate them more more in real time. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I think this is a very good question. And although I'm not going to be able to go uh, in depth to respond to it, I think there, there's a case study where, that has a lot of information in step by step on, of, of this transition. But I think that um, the key activities were to to push the, the concept of CLA uh, at every stage of, of, of the project. Um, so part of the, um, uh, the studies that we conducted, uh, as I was saying, most of them, um, in most of them we engage enumerators. What we did for this study uh, was a different approach. We used uh, most of our staff, or most of the staff participated uh, in not only the implementation but also developing the concepts, developing the methodology, implementing and evaluating the results. Um, having a staff understanding the, the importance of this thought process at the beginning, uh, seeing firsthand uh, what is happening in the field, and then being able to come up with uh, potential solutions has been a, a key part in, in this process. Um, so but to get to this point, what um, senior staff has, has done is, uh, and I think it, it, it's been a, a very interesting process to really nurture uh, a learning culture in, in the organization. So we, as I was saying in my presentation, we included pause and reflect sessions. So these were um, spaces inside our regional meetings uh, or monthly meetings where at each of the offices, not only at headquarters where we're in a specific location, but we have offices in uh, five regions. At each of these locations, um, junior staff were very engaged in, in providing uh, their experiences in the field and hypothesizing on what could uh, be the cost for a specific problem and what were the potential solutions that he or she uh, believe we could implement. So I think uh, we really instituted a culture in which um, we tried our level best to make sure that no one um, was afraid to speak their mind in terms of um, failures or thinking that they would be uh, wrong. So we, we also um, included this concept of collaboration, learning and adapting into each of our quarterly meetings. We uh, have a two annual summits where we um, invite all the, the staff of the project and we generate or create a learning agenda for, for the uh, upcoming year. Uh, and in order to implement these things, uh, they need to be budgeted. So we do have um, a specific amount of money budgeted uh, for, to implement our, our learning agenda. So I think it, it's been a, a very um, integral process and um, something that, uh, that um, I think it's, it's important to, to highlight is that um, our, our staff has a really changed. I, I've been here in the project with a for about a year and a half now, uh, and I've seen since the moment I arrived, and this is not because of, of me, but because of how the culture has um, 
has impregnated into um, our team members. And you see that there is a more critical opinion uh, at every step of the way. And we were able not to include this just as a, um, uh, as a part of our research uh, targets, but you see that there is a learning culture in every process that we conduct as an organization, even internally. So, for instance, um, a, we have a finance paying a, a certain amount of, of money of, a, to, to farmers for participating in this activity. So, uh, we did provide to farmers something I didn't mention before, um, sort of a wage a, or a daily wage in, 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 a, at the end of the of the week. So they receive seven days a, of, of payment, and, and not for participating in the activity, but because of the time they were investing in in the journals. And this would ensure um, high data quality. So when we began, and because we had to bring the payment sheets from a, the field. Uh, and there were couples, some of the couples uh, only owned uh, one phone number and the phone number wasn't uh, on the name of that person, it was on the name on another one. It was always very difficult to get this, these payments on time. Uh, so we initially started this process and paying farmers two weeks after they participated in the activity and by the time we finished we uh, paid farmers in 48 hours. So we, uh, we implement this, this learning culture and this transition. Um, to to every activity that we conduct uh, internally. And, and just to close, I think that what also pushes us to be able to implement this uh, decision is as we go is that we have this sense of urgency for, for change. Um, this, we, we have the evidence and not amending our, our interventions would be um, harming ourselves in, in terms of the impact that, that we can achieve. So I think that uh, being able to institute a sense of urgency throughout the, the whole project from senior staff to uh, junior staff has been a, a key part in, 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 this, in, in this transition. Great. Thank you so much, Rodrigo. I'm mindful of time, so I want to quickly turn it over to Delene and Winfrieda to see if there's anything that, that they would like to add or, or to speak to. Um, maybe just as an overall statement, I think uh, you've asked us to join just to share a, a different perspective in terms of a global multinational and our perspective on, on this issue. I think it's just imp uh, important for us that uh, Unilever is strong on the journey of recognizing and being open to the fact that there is an issue that needs to be addressed. I don't think we're um, close to solving it, but it's a journey for us. And certainly for us, we take it as a very uh, serious commitment um, that uh, we will put as many programs as we need behind it to make sure that we support our employees and communities around around it uh, to uh, you know have a, a, a better place to live, better place to work, and that they are safe and and, and healthy and supported. Do you want to add yeah. something, Yeah, yeah. Um, I've just seen a lot of um, introduction around unpaid care work, and maybe just to speak to that, and um, also looking at the time there is quite an exciting um, tool to use. Um, Maybe just two things that I thought would speak to that. Um, we look at, for example, um, caring for the child or nurturing the child, breastfeeding, some of the unpaid care work that we have recognized as a business, the time that women go to look for food or they go to cook. For us, that is, is, is some of the unpaid care work um, that we find that keeps women away from doing other productive, uh, um, productive chores. So what, what we have done, for example, is we have, um, uh, we have established a number of daycare centers across our plantations and um, also put in what we call breastfeeding centers to allow women also to breastfeed and also keep their children safe during the day so then they don't have to be rushing back to their house and, um, and, and, and miss out on their wages and also give them um, some time during the day to go and breastfeed, which then... Um, is paid time for them when they go to breastfeed as part of our policy. So that also ensures that our women are not losing on, um, on, 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 they're not losing on their income because of the, what we consider the unpaid care work. Then the other thing that we do is we also do bulk cereals. We bring bulk cereals to, 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 to households every other month to ensure that women don't walk long distances 
or don't have to, have to travel outside the plantations all the time to go and look for, um, for example, maize, which is really um, um, used to cook our staple food, which in, in our country we call like ugali. And the same happens in Tanzania. So we make sure that we also allow women to have time on their hands to do other productive um, things. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Winfrieda and Deline. So I want to thank everyone for, for joining today and for being willing to talk about this topic. We were thrilled because for a topic that is so difficult and many don't want to talk about, we had a lot of interest and people willing to listen. And I very much appreciate both the Nathaka 2 Project and Unilever being willing to so openly talk about what their processes um, and kind of reactions and how they've been working um, against gender-based violence in their own in their own work has been. So thank you very much. In about a week's time, there will be a recording of this webinar available as well as the transcript. And have a wonderful morning, afternoon, and evening.